My name is Michelle Ramey. Today's video technician. Our court reporter is Lisa Migliori. We're located at 222 St. Clair Street in Frankfort, Kentucky for the deposition of Commissioner Philip Burnett, Jr. Pursuant to notice in Franklin Circuit Court, action numbers 23 CI 00363 and 22 CI 00615. Styled Vicki Day versus Kentucky State Police et al. And the second one, Jennifer Sandlin versus Kentucky State Police et al. The date is August 31st, 2023, and the time is 9.35 a.m. Council, please identify yourselves and whom you represent. Thomas Clay for the plaintiffs, Jennifer Sandlin and Vicki Day. I'm Peter Irvin, and with Robin Cornett and Samantha Bevins represent the defendant, Kentucky State Police. What's your short answer? You swear for and tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Would you tell us your name, please, sir? It's Philip Burnett, Jr. Uh, can I call you Commissioner? Sure. Commissioner, what have you done to prepare for your testimony here today? Uh, I have talked with uh, my legal counsel. And then uh, I've also looked at the uh, interrogatories that were submitted. Have you looked at any other documents? Uh, yes, I have looked over uh, uh, with the interrogatories. I've looked over uh, uh, I guess interrogatories. Uh, that's really about all I know on that. So okay. Yeah. Well, let me ask you some specific sure. questions about what you might have reviewed. <clears throat> the name Freddie Gregory, you, you know what I'm talking about there, right? I do, sir. Have you reviewed any documents in relation to that litigation? I have, yes. What have you reviewed? I have reviewed a deposition of myself, as well as uh, Mr. Gregory, as well as, uh, uh, as the inter interrogatories that were submitted with that. Have you looked at Neil Ward's deposition? Yes. Uh, have you reviewed any court rulings or anything of that nature? No. <clears throat> so, uh, with regard to Sergeant Day, there was an investigation uh, based on Bethany Maynard's EEO complaint. There were documents generated as a result of that investigation. Have you reviewed any of those documents? The only document I reviewed on that was uh, the EEO investigation that was conducted by the cabinet. Okay, and I believe there were certain memoranda that you authored regarding Sergeant Day submitting to an IE interview. Have you reviewed those memoranda, sir? Yes, I would assign those about uh, from uh, the best. Can I see those? Because I would need to see exactly what I signed. Uh, yeah, I'm going to show them to Most you. of that would come from uh, the Internal Affairs Commander. Right, I understand that, but it would go through your hands, though, wouldn't it? Not necessarily. Would you approve it? I would have to see. I'd have to see what that is to be able to approve first. Well, if IA is interviewing a sergeant like Sergeant Day, would you have to authorize that interview? I would not. <clears throat> okay. Now you know there's also been an issue raised about the propriety of a trip to El Paso, Texas, from June the 5th to June the 8th of 2022. Have you reviewed documents in relation to that trip? I have reviewed some documents, but I don't know specifically. You'd have to show me what documents are asked, what I'd be Well, I'm not going to show them to you. I'm just asking you, did you review them? What documents in particular? I'm asking you, sir, what documents you reviewed in preparation for your testimony here today regarding the El Paso trip? I did review the memorandum that was submitted by Lieutenant uh, Colonel Mike Rogers requesting the travel. Okay. Um, any other documents that you reviewed in relation to the trip to El Paso? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Have I covered all the documents you reviewed that you recall? I have, that I recall, but I review a multitude of documents uh, in my day-to-day -day duties. I understand that, sir, but I'm asking you specifically about documents you reviewed in preparation for your testimony during this deposition. That's all that I can recall. Okay. Are you familiar with the term Brady Cop? Yes. What's your understanding of what Brady Cop means? 
That is someone that has uh, that has lied, that has been or been mistruthful or withheld evidence, that has been something that has been detrimental in a criminal investigation. Okay. Now you're familiar, of course, with the litigation involving Freddie Gregory. Yes. And you gave a deposition in that case. Yes. You reviewed that deposition? Yes. Is there anything in that deposition you wish to change? No. I object to the form of that. You can answer. You did. All right. Uh, did you review the deposition of Neil Ward? Yes. Are you familiar with his contents enough to answer questions about it? I would have to say specifically what uh, you'd be in context to if I had the deposition in front of me. All right. <clears throat> What case are we on here? The case is Freddie Gregory versus no, Pete. Are, are we on Jennifer Sandlin's case? We're on both we of them. On... His status, uh, there's Mr. Ward's deposition. Um, it's on both of them. So what I want to ask you, sir, in reviewing his deposition, does he say that he looked at the video that Mr. Gregory created? Yes. And he said he didn't see anything that constituted disorderly conduct, correct? To my recollection, he said nothing he felt like that he could get a conviction on. Well, he said he didn't see anything on disorderly conduct, didn't he? he to my understanding, anything that he could get a conviction on. Okay. <clears throat> so, did he express any opinion as whether there was evidence of disorderly conduct? Objection. The deposition will speak for itself. That's an improper objection during a video deposition, ma'am. Well, we'll make our objections. Don't you worry about it. Well, I'm going to worry about it, Peter, and I'll get the judge to come in here and correct it if That's I need fine. to. You do what you think you need. To. I will do, do it. I, do. I will. I, Don't one worry. One time. I, I, we're losing record. The question was, sir, did Mr. Ward testify in that deposition that he saw anything that constituted probable cause? You give him your best recollection? The best of my recollection that he did not have enough to obtain a conviction. That's not my question. That's my his answer to your question. Move on. I'm not moving on. I'm going to get an answer to the question, Peter. I'm not going to sit here and let you do that. Well, you just do it. Let's get the judge. We're not on the record when we're talking simultaneously. I cannot capture it. Second time you've asked that very same question. And he didn't answer either time. Same answer. That is his answer. I see the judge. You go see him. You want to come with me or not? You go see you the judge. You let me know if you get an audience. Time is 9.43. We're now back on the record. Time is 10.03 a.m. Sir, you understand what probable cause is, don't you? Yes. In reviewing Mr. Ward's deposition, did he ever indicate that he saw probable cause in that videotape? The best I can recollect by reviewing that, he said he did not determine probable cause. He just determined if he had enough for a conviction. Okay. So, uh, have you reviewed the video of that interaction between you and Mr. Gregory? Yes. How many times? Several. Can you give us the best estimate? You know, that, that happened in 2009. I had court proceeding, I would say. Uh, Probably excess of nine or ten. Okay. Uh, you gave your deposition in that litigation, I believe. Yes. Were you shown the video at the outset of your deposition? Yes. And you're also shown it again uh, at the end of your deposition, I believe. So you're actually shown it twice. Yes. And there was a transcript of that video also. Yes. Did KSP have possession of that video? No. That, well, they did when they were in the litigation, yes. Okay. And it was part of the file? Yes. So is it still in the file, do you know? I don't know, I don't know about the file. Do you know where the file is? I do not. Is it an open file or closed file to your knowledge? 
that would have been closed right after the trial, and I would assume. The trial's in December 2015, I believe, correct? Uh, I'm not for sure on the year. It was several years later, probably so. Yeah, I believe it was, yes. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, actually, that trial started, and there was jury selection and opening statements were made, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then after that, there was a recess taken, and there was a settlement reached with Mr. Gregory. I believe, the best of my recollection, that the video was shown on the first day, and then it was the start of the next day that morning when uh, their counsel uh, said that the, Mr. Burnett has not even offered our client one dollar. Okay. And that was true, wasn't it? Yes. In fact, uh, you were sued individually, correct? Yes. Did KSP indemnify you? Yes. And you had counsel there also, I believe. Mr. Wright, was he one of them? No. He uh, was initially uh, during uh, depositions, but he was not during the trial. Okay. Uh, Matt Feltner was counsel during the trial, I believe. Yes. And uh, do you have any reason to believe that that video is not in the file that KSP had or has at this time? I don't know. I can't, I've not looked at the file. I can't say either which way. Well, you know, in response to the request for admission that I submitted uh, asking about that video, the response was that, they, that you wanted a copy of the video, correct? Re repeat the question. Yes, sir. The request for admission number 11, where I asked you to admit certain things, and the response was that if we're referring to the video, that you all wanted a copy of the videotape, correct? I can't recollect on that. I don't, I'd have to see that. All right. I had my own copy from when uh, I was litigated. That's how I reviewed the tape. So you had a copy of it? In my own personal file. <clears throat> well, let me show you your response to the request for admission, number 11. Is that, in fact, your response, sir? Objection to the form. That is not his answer. That is counsel's answer. Well, you're again violating the rule of civil procedure, well, Mr. Irvin, by stating what your objection you is. I'm sorry. Witness. I'm not going to let you mislead him. Well, like that. you're not going to follow the rules then. Maybe we need I'm to get the judge the back rules. out again. I'm, we're not on the record. I cannot make out two statements at the same time. I'm, I'm not going to let you mislead the witness. I'm not misleading the witness, Mr. Irvin. Yes, you are. Where, is his signature on there? It's his answer, sir. He prepared the answers to those discovery requests. I don't know, sir. Well, you ought to know. Is his signature on there? No, that was a problem. Nobody signed it in violation of the civil rules. Well, maybe that would demonstrate whether he knows anything about that answer. Well, I'm going to ask him about it. And I hope if you have an objection, you'll follow the judge's instructions and do it by the rules for a change. You have a question? Have you had a chance to read that, sir? I have. May I have it back? It says, presumably the facts are in the tape referenced in the request. Defendant object to the request because no tape, i.e. no facts, was provided for the defendants to review as part of this request. Well, you have a copy of the tape, don't you, sir? I was not asked if I had a copy. Well, did you review this before it was filed, this response here? But I didn't review the file. No, not till that was, uh, that was submitted. My name is not on that. I did not. Okay. It's asking you to admit that the tape of Gregory's arrest by Burnett shows that Gregory did nothing that will legitimately constitute either disorderly conduct or menacing. Objection. Did I read that correctly? Objection. No, you did not read it correctly. That inter or request is not to him personally. And that's the way you asked the question. I didn't ask. 
It is. Now, how many of you are going to object? I'm going to object. Well, then tell her to quit objecting. I'm not going to tell her anything. Okay. Are, are you going to object, ma'am? I can refrain. I, uh, it's just instinct, Mr. Clay. You know how it is if you're a lawyer sitting in deposition. It's just a natural thing. But I'll defer to Mr. Irvin. Sir, this is a request for admission submitted to the Con Commonwealth Kentucky, Kentucky State Police, correct? Yes. It calls for information within your knowledge, correct? Objection to the form. This was about the file. I, I did not review what was in the file at KSP. Sir, does it call for information within your knowledge? Object as to... He's asking you to interpret his question. Mr. Irvin, I am not going to sit here and let you do that. Now I'm going to go get the judge again. You know what the rules are. The judge read them to you. Not on the record. If you'd like it on the record, I'll need you to repeat it one at a time. Again, to my understanding, it was requested what was in the file. I did not review what was in the file. Sir, my question was, did you have input into that response? Yes. Okay. What input did you have? I don't know that I was requested about what, if a tape existed or not. They were no, looking sir. at the file at KSP. My question was, what input did you have into that response? <clears throat> Objection to the form. Presumes evidence not in record. Yes. I really don't understand what you're trying to ask me here. This is the file that they've requested. I did not know that what was in the file, what was not. I did not review the file that was submitted during discovery for the Gregory arrest. Okay. Did you provide any information that is included in that response to the request for admission? <coughs> not specifically on this one about a videotape. No, I did not. Okay. So, when this says, admit that a review of the tape of Gregory's arrest by Burnett shows that Gregory did nothing that would legitimately constitute either disorderly conduct or menacing, what's your answer to that? The tape, the tape did show that. It did show that. It did? I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't have arrested him. Okay. What did the, shape, the tape show that constituted either menacing? Well, you didn't arrest him for menacing, did you? I told him that I was arresting him for menacing. Right, but you didn't. Uh, I, that was a class B misdemeanor as well as disorderly conduct. So I didn't want to load up charges on him uh, for the same event. Did you understand my question, sir? I did. What was it? Did I arrest him? Uh, for menacing, and I and I told him that I'd arrest him for menacing, but I did not put that on the citation. But I explained to him at the jail when we were down there to process when I filled out the citation why that I charged him with disorderly, and I was not going to put the additional charge of menacing, which is what I originally told him that he was placed under arrest for, as well as the failure to wear a seatbelt. Okay, did you arrest him for menacing? I told him I was placing him under arrest for menacing. I just did not list that citation on, uh, I did not list that charge on the citation, but I described the event that occurred. Okay, so my question stands, sir. Was he arrested for menacing? When I instructed him he was placed under arrest, I did tell him menacing, but I also I charged him and placed him under arrest for disorderly conduct 
but when we're at the jail and then I'm filling out the citation, I explain to him that I'm not going to charge him with disorderly conduct and menacing and failure to wear seatbelt. And the reason why is because one of the main issues he was concerned about <coughs> was he felt like he was on a private roadway. And I just didn't want to load up charges on him. It's a yes or no question. Did you arrest him for menacing? I told him, as you can see on the video, that I was arresting for menacing. I just did not place that on the citation. So I'm just trying to get a simple answer to sure. a simple question, sir. Did you arrest him for menacing, yes or no? If you look at the video, I told him that I placed him under arrest for menacing. I did not charge him with that on the citation. His actual arrest was for disorderly conduct and for failure to wear a seatbelt. Okay, so you did arrest him for menacing. Objection to the form. Don't answer that. Certify the question. What did Mr. Gregory do that constituted the offense of menacing? When I, when I stop him, um, as you can see on the video, uh, that all of a sudden he, I tell him that he's on a roadway. Uh, He's blocking the roadway, and then uh, I say he doesn't have a seatbelt on, and then he wants to say that uh, he's not out on a public roadway. He said that, uh, that I believe it was a private roadway, but it was not on a public roadway. And I explained, yes, it is. And I said, there's a road sign there. And uh, Gregory Lane, uh, I've lived uh, in Bell County my entire life. I know what a public roadway is and what a private roadway is. So he becomes defiant about that. I ask him several times for his operator's license. Uh, he does not want to provide that. Uh, then uh, he sticks his finger out and puts it in conjunction towards my chest out through the window. Uh, and then uh, he's saying that I'm harassing him, which has not been harassment because I'd only placed, only had uh, stopped him one time previously on an ATV that he was operating on a public roadway. Uh, that was uh, against the law. Is that what constituted the menacing? That in the fact that uh, how his, um, he put me in fear of, of my personal safety. Okay. Uh, anyone that is right there and he's, uh, and I explained to him that it was not a public roadway, or that was private roadway, that it was public, that he did, that he did have a seatbelt on. He did not have a seatbelt on. And then that he was pointing his finger at me and being defiant in the fact you have to look at this as well because the pre previous interaction I had with him, I stopped him on a roadway and I, on, a U on a UTV side by side, uh, which is against the law. Did not know who he was or anything whatsoever. Uh, I stopped him and then I asked him for his driver's license. And then at that time, he did not want to give me his driver's license. He was saying, you have uh, no reason to be up here stopping people on a road on a side-by-side, -side, on an ATV up in this hall, and I said, yes, I do. I said, we're getting drug information that there's drug trafficking going on up here. And um, he does not want to give me his driver's license. You know, at that time, he's, uh, he's, very, uh, uh, he's very aggressive and shouting at that point as well, uh, very high, high tone in his voice. Um, and then I asked him for his license repeatedly, and he finally gives them to me, and because uh, I didn't know who he was. And then I asked him that I'm up here. Does he have a nickname? And he said, "Why?" And I said, "Because I received information that someone by the name of Pinhead is trafficking in narcotics up here. That's even why I'm here." And then he becomes very upset because he wants to know who that uh, told me that, and uh, I was not going to give him that information. And then I told him, I said, well, I'm not going to give you a citation today. I said, I'm going to give you a warning. Uh, but I said, you know, we'll have to be up in here because we are receiving uh, multiple complaints up in the area for drug trafficking. So I did not issue a citation. I did not impound his four-wheeler. I gave him a verbal warning and led him on his way. So that first interaction that we had, he was very, uh, very, uh, very aggressive. Uh, his tone and that type of thing. So when I stopped him the second time, I wasn't 100% sure that it was him, uh, but I did, uh, I did think there's a good possibility of it. And then obviously I just asked for his driver's license 
and then he's not wanting to give me his driver's license. Uh, he sticks that finger out at me, said I'm harassing him. I'm not. Um, and, uh, you know, he's pointing out through the wind out towards my chest. Uh, I knew at one time before that uh, he was armed. And uh, taking all that in context, someone that just keeps arguing, and he says, just take me to jail, even after I made that comment, that's not a reasonable, not reasonable. Uh, at that time, then, I felt like that I was in fear of my safety being there. Any other facts that you considered in determining he should be arrested for menacing? Have you told us all the facts? Uh, you know, again, uh, I did what I felt like was the best at that time. They was a, uh, a young girl in the vehicle. Uh, they was, um, I think, in that area. He has some family members there. Um, and based on, based on all those circumstances in particular, it was a bad situation. And the fact that who's going to protest just asking to see their driver's license and then uh, pointing his finger at me knowing uh, his background, knowing that I'm having information that uh, there is drug trafficking in the area and dealing with him. Uh, it was just a bad situation. Any other facts? No, just the fact that I asked him several times for his driver's license. He did not want to give them to me. Uh, was protesting that, uh, you know, he was, uh, he said he was on his own property. You know, and the fact that he's sticking his finger out at me uh, and the prior interaction that we had with him. You know, anyone that tells you that you have no business being up in a holla when he knows very well that you can't ride an ATV on a roadway up in there, uh, then I become concerned for my safety as well as a little girl uh, to be in there how he was acting because I knew that he was probably armed. Okay. I just want to be sure we got all the facts. Is that all of them? That's all I can think of at this time. Okay. It was since 2009. Yes, sir. I understand. It. Well, now, if an uh, allegation of being untruthful, it, it's a Class A violation for KSP, is that correct? Yes. And do you have anybody on the command staff who's had an allegation of untruthfulness be substantiated? I do not know that in particular firsthand. Well, I don't care about firsthand, sir. Do you know about it at all from any source whatsoever? I have heard, I have not seen that we did have a former major, Jamie Heller, that had a honesty charge. Well, you heard her testimony, Captain Sandlin's testimony yesterday, didn't you? I did. And she identified Captain, or Major Heller as having an uh, allegation sustained against him for being untruthful. I correct? think that's what she said, but I didn't see any documentation, or I don't think there was any documentation produced of such. Okay, well, if it's true, does it go in his personnel file? It should. And when is it removed? I think it's 10 years after they retire. Okay. So or, or separate from the agency. Just because it happened 10 years ago doesn't mean it's not going to still be in a personnel file, correct? I don't know if it would be in the personnel file or if it would just be in an IA file. Well, there'd be a record of it with KSP, though. Should be if it was substantiated, as All a right. say. Now, uh, we've talked about the menacing. I want to talk about the disorderly conduct. I want you to tell us all the facts that Mr. Gregory engaged in that caused you to charge him with disorderly conduct. You know, the big issue with him, he kept saying that he was on his uh, own property, which I knew that he was not. Uh, and that was even, uh, uh, you know, that was one of the big contentious issues with that. So, as you can see, uh, or see on the, on the video, that you do have uh, you do have him screaming that was after the the point that he was arrested i told him he was arrested for menacing uh, but it was in a pu public place there were people around it was in the middle of the day on the, uh, on a saturday so there's there's uh there's houses around I don't think there's anybody in particular right there but there's houses around it's a it's a community so it's in a little hollow uh, and the fact that he was on a public roadway and then, uh, you know, I saw that as a threatening manner that how he was acting, pointing his finger towards me, not wanting to give me his driver's license, say, take me to jail. Uh, so with all that 
and then being on the public roadway and then as you can hear that he's screaming there after uh, uh, after he was placed under arrest and then that's why that I charged him with a disorderly conduct because of on the public roadway and I explained to him at the jail why that I went with disorderly conduct instead of the menacing because they were both class B misdemeanors and I was just not going to arrest him uh, on two class B misdemeanors okay for the same event any other facts that you relied on to establish a charge of disorderly conduct no just that it was in a public roadway it was in the public and uh, that uh, I saw that is uh, uh, I think it was public annoyance or uh, or being loud that so that's how I come with a disorderly conduct so we've got all the facts on the record now that you based your charge of disorderly conduct on. Objection to the form. Yes. Okay. Now, Mr. Ward, uh, obviously, according to his deposition, he watched the video. Correct. Yes. He dismissed the disorderly conduct and the no seat belt. Correct. Yes. Did he consult with you about that? He did not. You found out about it after the fact, didn't you? Yes. Did you go back to Mr. Ward and say, uh, excuse me, what's going on here? Or did you have any communication with Mr. Ward about why, you dis why he dismissed the case? Yes, I did. Tell us about that. Uh, because on the way to jail, uh, he told me, uh, what's he, uh, Mr. Gregor said numerous things, uh, but one thing in particular, he said, I'm going to have your job, I'm going to have you taken care of, I'm going to sue you. So I knew that that was potentially an issue. Uh, so when that was dismissed, and I'm always one that attends court uh, every subpoena, so if, uh, if anything is dismissed uh, or if I can't attend because I have training, then I'm always in con consultation with the county attorney's office. Uh, but it did concern me that uh, I had a case that was dismissed without at least the prosecutor uh, talking to me because that's typical practice that usually if there is something that's dismissed that they'll talk with us. So what did you all talk about? Talked about, uh, I asked him, I said, did you uh, dismiss the charge? And he said, yes. And uh, he said, and he had a video. And uh, I said, well, I wish, you know, that we could have discussed it because there's more to the video. There's a lot of background to this video. Uh, like how the first interaction that I had with Mr. Gregory, um, you know, why that that progressed to where that progressed to has been the first time that I dealt with him on the ATV. It wasn't just that video and I have to know the mindset of receiving information as well as some of the background surrounding uh, him and his family in that area. Okay, so what did Mr. Ward say? You know, I don't remember in particular. He said, you know, I didn't just dismiss it. I think he said I, I dismissed it without prejudice, that we could bring it back up. But I said, you know, I'm not going to do that. Uh, and uh, that's the biggest thing that I can remember from that. Any, any other conversation between you and Mr. Ward about his dismissing the disorderly conduct and no seat belt? Not that I can recall. Do you recall when the lawsuit was filed where you were named individually and Mr. Gregory filed suit against you in federal court? Yes. When was that filed, sir, if you recall? I want to say 2010 or 11. I, okay. I'm not for sure. Well, this arrest took place in 2009, didn't it? Yes. So are you aware of what the statute of limitations is on a civil action for wrongful arrest and civil rights violations? No. Okay. <clears throat> Now, you said that you've been getting reports about Mr. Gregory trafficking in drugs, right? Yes. Uh, do you know the identity of any of those individuals? I do. Do you have records of it? I do not. Sir? I do not. Uh, who were they? That was anonymous information that, uh, that I was given, uh, that we don't, re we don't reveal anonymous information, and I have never have uh, revealed that. Okay. Well, do you know who made those reports to you? Yes. You know the identity of those people? I do know that person. So they're not anonymous then if you know their identity, are they? Yes. He did not want to be named. Well, I understand they didn't want to be named, but I'm asking you to tell me who they were. Objection to the form. 
You don't have to answer that. Certify the question. Uh, when did you receive that information, sir? I received, uh, I saved information about him several months, couple months before that I even stopped him the first time on the ATV. And then that day, uh, I was, uh, I'm the range, I was a range officer for the Harlan Post at that time. And I was down there building targets in Knox County. Um, I received a, received a call uh, that there was a lot of drug traffic up in the area. It was on a, a Saturday during the day and um, wanted some police presence up there. So when I finished my detail at, uh, at the range in Knox County on my way home, because I was due off at four o'clock, and I think that, uh, that interaction time was 2.30 or three o'clock uh, on my way home, and then I just drove up through there uh, because there's supposedly a lot of traffic in and out of the holler and a lot of drug traffic uh, that day and concerning with, uh, with him Okay. Now, was there any investigation done into Mr. Gregory's alleged drug activity? There's, we always have investigations that we're looking at, uh, see if there's drug activity. Uh, but I don't know anything specifically that he was, uh, he was arrested or charged with. Well, my question was, was he investigated? We take complaints and then we look at, we have our troopers, we have our detectives, and they take what information that they have and then we try to see if we can develop any further information for uh, an investigation. Okay, was information developed that led to an investigation, Mr. Gregory? Well, we had to have more information, such as uh, an informant, or we would have to have that he was uh, actually in possession of illegal drugs, but at that time we did not have that. Well, you got a report from an individual, you know who the identity of that person, and was that person's information based upon first-hand observation, or was it rumor, or how, what was his inf that in that person's information based upon? Uh, based upon him living in a community and seeing him uh, every day and his uh, interactions with people there in the community and people in and out of his home. So that would be first-hand information, wouldn't it? Not necessarily. You'd have to go more than just uh, just one call. Well, you were a lieutenant back then, correct? Yes. So you had people working for you. Yes. Including drug investigators. Yes. Did you have any of those uh, individuals you were supervising do any kind of drug investigation into Mr. Gregory? No. And you also talked about the disorderly conduct there being people around where his truck was parked. And I understand you say it's a public road and he said it's a private road. I get all that. Who were the people who were standing around, sir? I did not say there's people standing around. I said it was on a Saturday. Uh, during the day in that community, there's homes around, there's people in and out. It's just a, uh, it's kind of a busy community. I didn't say anybody was right, standing right there. Well, as I wrote it down, you said there were people around. What I meant, what I, uh, when I elaborate on that, that is that there's how there's people outside at their homes. That is a community, it's kind of like a holla. It's just not where that's just one or two homes. There's a lot of people around. There's a lot of residents around. Did you see anybody who was there observing or hearing what was going on between you and Mr. Gregory? Not in particular. <clears throat> okay. Are you aware of any court rulings regarding the evidence in this case involving Mr. Gregory? You have to elaborate more on that. No, I'm asking you if you're aware of any court rulings. Yes, I've received a summary judgment in the Eastern District uh, dismissing the, the case. By Judge the Van Tatenhoe? I'm sorry. Yeah, the, by Judge Van Tatenhoe in London. Okay, was that the end of it? No. What happened? Uh, they appealed it and it went to the Sixth Circuit. All right, what did the Sixth Circuit do? They remanded it back down to a, a trial in the London District. Okay, and have you seen the Sixth Circuit opinion? I have not. Well, I want to show it to you. And I want to be sure I understand this. You have not seen this Sixth Circuit opinion. I'll have to see it. I would assume that I have probably saw this now that it's in front of me because uh, that would have been my investigation. So yes, I probably would have seen this. Anything in that opinion that troubles you? I've not read this in years. 
we'll take a look at it. Well, it's issued in 2014, wasn't it? That's what it says. It's filed here, August of 20th, 2014. Okay. Whatever you need to do to refresh your memory with that, uh, please do so. You want to sit here while he reads it? Suits me. Let's go off the record and give him a chance to read it. Going off the record, time is 10.35. Be careful. We're now back on the record. Time is Be careful about putting that up. Sir, have you had a chance to review that opinion from the Sixth Circuit? Yes. Anything in there trouble you? I want to object to the form and instruct you not to answer that. Certify the question. Turn to page eight. Okay. Under arrest. Okay. Read the first sentence. A review of the tape shows that Gregory did nothing that would legitimately constitute either disorderly conduct or menacing. That's a problem, isn't it? Objection to the form, don't answer that. That makes you a liar, doesn't it, sir? Objection to the form, don't answer that. Let's go get the judge. Off the record. We're going off the record, time is 1049. We're now back on the record, time is 1113. Sir, I want to talk about Sergeant Vicki Day's case, if we could. Um, Are you aware of any diagnosis has been rendered on her by a healthcare professional? I saw a uh, a uh, doctor's note putting her off uh, on sick, but I don't know exactly what the determination was. Okay. Do you recall anything about what the doctor's note said? I do not. I just remember seeing a doctor's note and putting her off on sick time. Okay. Uh, was she on FMLA? I don't know if she was actually coded of that or not. I don't know, but I do know that she was off on sick leave. Okay. Um, her case was interviewed by Cat Reed, I believe, correct? Yes. And was that on November 29th of 2022? Do you recall? I do believe it was in November, but I don't know the specific date. Have you reviewed that interview? Yes. Did Sergeant Day raise concerns in there about irregularities with regard to the trip to El Paso, Texas from June the 5th to June the 8th of 2022? She did mention that uh, she had concerns with that, with that, but that's been some time since I, I read that, but she did bring some concerns about that trip. Do you recall any specifics about what those concerns might have been? She felt like that uh, it wasn't a warranted trip, and she was upset that females were traveling on that trip along with her husband, the best of my recollection. Okay. Did she allege that any rules or regulations had been violated as a result of that trip? I don't know specifically. Generally, did she, do you recall? Generally, she had some concerns. I can't say that they were rules or regulations, but the best of my recollection, she was upset that females were there and she did not feel like that the particular females that were there should have been there with the command staff at that trip. Should they have been there with the command staff? Yes. Why? Due to uh, the what EPIC and uh, that is in El Paso, the duties that they had was associated with the basis for the trip, license plate readers. That was uh, the memorandum that was submitted uh, you had uh, the command staff members that went and then the civilians that went, they were females and three of them were uh, intelligence uh, commanders with I think the west, east and central of uh, the intelligence. They were like uh, supervisors there. So that was a big part of their duties dealing with that. And then the four female uh, she was administrator of the ASAP grant, which paid for that trip. And she also, by purchasing equipment with the ASAP grant, uh, one of the things they purchased with is uh, license plate readers, uh, that type of thing. So the grant pays for that. So she had a vested interest in to know 
what basically the return was on purchasing that equipment for what happens at Epic at uh, El Paso. So the females were authorized to be on that trip for legitimate reasons? Yes. Who were the females? Uh, it was Bethany Maynard, Heather Hibbets, uh, Meredith Bales, and the fourth one, that's saying, I, I can't remember her name. Did, uh, there was a lieutenant colonel on the trip? Yes. That was Lieutenant Colonel? Mike Rogers. Did any of these females work for Colonel Rogers? Basically, all of them would be in the chain of command in operations. But uh, Bethany Maynard is a, a justice program administrator, but is also directly, uh, uh, also does administrative duties for the oper Office of Operations Lieutenant Colonel, which was Mike Rogers. Okay, uh, any of the other females travel with Colonel Rogers on other KSP sponsored trips? I, I don't know if they have or not. I would have to look and see on travel requests. <coughs> now, were all the regulations that KSP is governed by followed with regard to the uh, documentation on that trip, sir? There was a uh, memorandum that was uh, submitted by Lieutenant Rogers, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rogers, uh, talking about the basis for the trip and then who all he was requested to go. Uh, that memorandum came to me and I approved that. Okay. But my question was, were there any uh, regulations that were violated as a result of that trip? KSP general orders specifically. Not that I'm aware of, no. You're familiar with the Form 138? Yes. Were there any 138s filled out on that trip? No, that was a memorandum because whenever we have a, for like, for instance, the Kentucky Derby. So if we have sent a bunch of troopers to the same training and the same event, instead of having multiple 138s, we will do a memorandum and that will list who all is going so that way there's not a multitude of 138s for travel requests where you could do it just on one memo. That's what our financial grants management section uh, requests that we do. So what would be a multitude of troops sent to a particular training session? What would constitute a multitude? I would say four or five plus. Okay. Is there a specific regulation that deals with out-of-state travel on 138s? That uh, you do submit a, uh, a 138 on travel, on policy. For out-of-state travel? Uh, I forget the exact form, but we do submit, but we also, financial grants management, we do the memorandum in lieu of that. We have done that on multiple other entities. Well, but my question is specific. There's a specific general order that requires the Justice and Public Safety Cabinet to approve 138s for out-of-state travel. Isn't that true? I would have to see specifically reading that regulation, but I do know uh, through the course of my employment, being at the command staff, that we have used a memorandum. And even, uh, even my days when I was a post commander, that we use a memorandum if you have multiple people going on the same trip. You can use a memorandum instead of 138. If you have multiple people to save on having to conduct multiple 138s travel requests, yes, we do that. All right, and that would include, of course, this trip to El Paso, or is that what you're saying? Yes. All right, so the memo was okay? Yes. Did the memo follow the normal chain of command for its approval? Yes, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rogers submitted that directly to me because I would be the next uh, line uh, review for him and then after that then I will send on through financial grants management and if there's any issues then they will bring that up. So you don't have final approval authority for that trip is that correct? Well I actually do as uh, as uh, the appointing authority but also uh, on out of state that will go above me and that, those go over to the cabinet to be looked at as well. The cabinet for justice and public safety? Yes. This one didn't go to justice did it? I don't know. Went straight to the governor's office, didn't it? 
I believe, I know that it wound up at the governor's office. I don't know if it was routed through uh, the public justice cabinet as well, but I do know it wound up at the, there as well as any other out of state travel. So you don't know if it was approved or even routed through the justice and public safety cabinet. Is that what you're telling us? Yes. Should you have known that? I will approve it and then I'll give that to uh, my administrative specialist, Lucille Marshall, and then uh, she'll send those on from there. But that may not have went to the cabinet, I don't know. Who drew up the memo? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rogers submitted it. No, I ask you who drew it up. You'll have to ask him that, but that was submitted to me and had his signature on the, on the bottom of it. You don't know if Bethany Maynard drew that up? I do not know. Now, speaking of Bethany Maynard, um, what is her position? She's a Justice Public Administrator at JPA. Is she entitled to draw overtime? Uh, she can. Uh, I think the grant allows her to uh, draw uh, some overtime for that as well. We have other JPAs. Haley, Haley Samuel, she draws overtime on highway safety. Uh, Don Jefferson draws overtime dealing with the JAG. So yes, JPAs do draw some overtime. Well, Bethany Maynard drew some pretty good overtime from 2019 to 2023, didn't she? I don't know. You don't have any idea or any insight into how much overtime she was paid during that period of time? I don't approve that. But that's not my question, sir. You don't have any insight into that. I do know that she gets overtime through the ASAP grant, but that's all. I don't know how much. Would it surprise you know it was over $53,000? In overtime? Yes, sir. That would surprise me. Why? I just think that's an exorbitant amount, but I don't, I don't feel like she drew that. I feel like that was that amount of overtime. There's also overtime associated with that grant that can be paid to troopers and detectives that work on something in particular dealing with the ASAP grant. So I would not think that she whatsoever drew $53,000 in federal overtime or would overtime. She, would she be authorized? It would be federal overtime, wouldn't it? Uh, no, that's the state grant. State grant, okay. So it's state money, not federal money. That's correct. Okay. Um, would it be proper for her to draw overtime for her lunch hour? No, it would not. Who unless she's working, unless she's not taking a lunch and she's working on the grant during her lunch there, that would be the only way, but not that she's out getting, eating lunch and carrying time. But we do have uh, employees that work through their lunch hour uh, and be able to, to claim time if they just work through their lunch hour. But you don't know if Ms. Maynard uh, engaged in that same practice? I do not know. Okay. Do you know who would have approved her overtime during that period of time? That would have been uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rogers. Would there have been somebody before him? I would not think so. Colonel Slinker? Lieutenant Colonel oh, Slinker? Right. Yes. He would have approved it before Colonel Rogers? Could have. And it could have been me. Uh, I had that position before uh, uh, it was Lieutenant Colonel Slinker, and then it was myself, and then it was Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rogers. Okay. <coughs> Who's responsible for reviewing the award of overtime? Like, for, I don't, I don't, you have to repeat the question. Who's responsible for reviewing the award of overtime? Like who can administer the overtime? Well, no. Uh, who approves it? Who has authority to review it? Well, whenever you have a grant, you know, you'll have to have specifications of what the grant is spent on. So they will have overtime, like how much overtime was paid, and then obviously that would go back uh, to the ASAP grant. Uh, but there's only so much allowed uh, for, uh, you know, for overtime. It could be per... Uh, I don't know, I just have to see what the guidelines for the ASAP grant are. Do you have any responsibility for reviewing that, sir? I do not now, no. Okay. Who below you does, directly? Lieutenant, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rogers. All right. Now, you understand that uh, Sergeant Day was interviewed by Cat Reed back in November of last year. Yes. Have you, and you say you've reviewed that uh, interview? Not the actual interview, it was a, a synopsis that was put together uh, from Cat Reed at the cabinet that I had read. Okay, and that interview was conducted as a, review, a result of an EEO complaint, is that correct? 
Yes. Who filed the EEO complaint? Bethany Maynard. Has that uh, investigation been completed? The cabinet, uh, they, they did the interviews, they uh, formulated a, put that together, those <coughs> interviews, and they submitted that uh, from the cabinet. So then when we look at it, we saw that there was potential policy violations. Then that was submitted to Internal <coughs> Affairs. Okay. So were the allegations in the EEO complaint substantiated, not substantiated? What, what was the result of that investigation? Did not say substantiated or unsubstantiated because that would be dealing with Chapter 16 personnel. That report was submitted to us for the appointing authority for, however, for whatever direction to go forward. So Bethany Maynard made certain <laughs> allegations in that complaint, correct? Yes. Were those allegations founded or not founded, or was there any conclusion ever reached by the investigating agency as to whether there was any validity to those allegations? We are, that IA investigation is still continuing, and uh, I have not seen the final report on that to say either which way. When was that IA investigation initiated? I'm going to say maybe February. Of this year? Maybe, I'm not for sure, January, February, but it was uh, a little bit after, after able to go through and review and, uh, and go from there. But it was after Sergeant Day made her complaint, correct? Yes. Objection to the form. What complaint? Now, uh, you understand that Sergeant Day has experienced some difficulties as a result of the procedures that have been put in place regarding the internal affairs investigation. Would that be accurate, sir? You'll have to elaborate on that, sir. Are you aware of any mental health issues that have developed as a result of this IA investigation? I do know that she submitted a, uh, a doctor's excuse uh, to be off on sick leave. What was the basis of that sick leave, do you know? I would have to read uh, her excuse again, but I do not know in particular what uh, her reasoning is for that. All right, and did you order her to submit to an IE interview while she was on sick leave? We, we had some legal discussion whether that was... Objection, I don't yeah. want you to testify yeah. about what you discussed with legal. Sure. I didn't ask you what you discussed with legal, sir. I asked if you ordered her to submit to an IA investigation while she was on sick leave. <coughs> I believe so. Do you know if she was on FMLA at that time? I do not know what that was uh, actually coded at. I do not. Would it be proper for you to order her to come to work? She had to be on, on on uh, active status to be interviewed by IA, correct? We did consultation, I think, also with HR about the appropriateness of her to submit to uh, the IA interview because it had been pushed off so long. Okay, but if she's on FMLA, is it proper to order her to come and report to work to be on active status for that interview? I'm trying to think how that process worked. Um, I believe we did determine that that would be acceptable, but I don't believe that we ever had her to come in and uh, do an interview while she was off on sick leave. show you what we mark here as Exhibit 1. <coughs> I 
got a copy for him. Have you seen this, sir? I don't think that I have. But I do see a, an issue right here, Violet KRS-15. Uh, sworn troopers are under KRS Chapter 16, not uh, Chapter 15. Oh, I know that, sir. Trust me, I know that. I'm going to get into 15, 520. Don't worry. We'll get to it. Sure. My question, though, have you seen this letter? It may have been discussed with me, but I do not remember it in particular. Well, if it were hand-delivered, as it's represented here to Captain Trey Green, he is the commander of the IA branch, correct? Yes. What should he have done with this letter? I would assume that he would consult it with uh, our legal staff. Okay. Do you know if he did consult with your legal staff? I do not. You have to ask him that. Why am I asking you what you know, sir? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. So you're the one who ordered her to appear for this interview, though, correct? There was a lot of documentation during that time. Uh, I would have to see the entire, to see exactly when the dates were, when what was received, uh, when did she actually conduct an interview, because I do know they were, I think, some uh, postponements as well, but I, I can't say uh, for sure without seeing all the documentation from this. So there, we can not agree there were several times when she was ordered to appear for an IE investigation or an interview and she didn't appear, correct? Correct. Who ordered her to appear for those interviews? I don't know that she ever did appear until she come back from sick leave. No, that's not my question. Who ordered her to appear for the interview, sir? Then Captain Green. Captain Green has authority to order her to appear. That would be an after. Now, wait a minute. Let me finish my question. Mm -hmm. Captain Green has authority to order her to appear for an interview. That would be after consultation uh, with uh, our HR, our legal, and myself. Well, the buck stops with you, doesn't it, sir? Yes. So I, you, but also, I take, uh, uh, obviously, I have, I depend on a lot of things to make an uh, informed decision. I understand that. So, are you telling us you don't recall whether you ordered her to appear for this IE interview? I do know that I had her to appear before, or com for her to appear before an IE interview, but I do not know for sure if it was while she was on sick leave or not. I would have to see any documentation that come from me that would be signed to be able to say that. Okay. Were you familiar with this, inter <laughs> this interview that was ordered on, I believe it was July the 27th, the day after this letter? Okay. <coughs> Sir? Okay. And go ahead. Did you order her to appear for this interview? Yes, but I believe she had returned from sick, uh, sick leave. That's not my question, sir. It was very simple. Did you order her to appear for this interview? Yes. All right. And um, were you aware that when she appeared for this interview, that her health care provider had indicated that this interview could cause her severe emotional damage. Objection to the follow up. <clears throat> you repeat the question? Yes, sir. Were you aware when you ordered her to appear for this interview that her health care professional had indicated it would cause her severe emotional damage? But I believe she had returned to work. That's not my well. question, sir. Did you understand my question? Yes. He's what was it? To your um, no, he didn't. He's trying to answer. No, he question. didn't. 
I asked him if you were aware when you ordered her to appear for this interview that her health care professional had said this will cause her severe emotional damage. Yes or no? I don't know. I do not remember that in particular. I do not. But I do remember that she returned from sick leave at this Let time. me show you what we marked as Exhibit 2. I don't remember seeing this. Should you have seen it? I didn't see it. Sir, if you're ordering her to appear for an IA interview and her health care provider says it's going to cause her severe emotional damage, shouldn't you have seen this? Objection. Affidavit Exhibit 2? Objection to the form. It may have been discussed, but I've not seen this, and I can't say for sure, but I do know that she returned to work, and that is why that she conduct, we conducted the internal Sir, affairs investigation. I understand. You told me that several times that yeah. she'd returned to work. I get that. I understand what your testimony is. My question is, if you had seen this Exhibit 2, would you have ordered her to submit to this IA interview? Yes. Knowing that it would cause her severe emotional distress, according to her health care provider. Objection to the form. That's not what it says. Your objection's improper, Mr. Irvin. Again, for the dozenth time, your objection's improper. The judge read you the rule. I think you could follow it if he read it to you. Such action by KSP could result in irreparable harm to Sergeant Day's mental status. Did I read that correctly, sir, paragraph 6? Yes. And you would have ordered her to appear for this IE interview knowing that anyway? I would have known that she returned to full duty, yes. She returned to full duty. What, how do you come to that conclusion, sir? Because I think when she submitted paperwork to come back. What, what about her paperwork said she was returning to full duty? that uh, they was, she'd been released from her medical provider. That's what her paperwork work. said? Best, best I can remember, but I don't, I'd have to see that in front of me. But I do know they was released for her to come back to work. Was she released to be interviewed by IA? Uh, I don't know that a medical provider could say what she's with her job duties. A health care provider can authorize an employee to return to work under limitations. Is that true, sir? They can. Was that done in this case? Like I said, I didn't see this. If I did, I do not remember seeing it. Was it done in this case, sir, if you know? I don't know. Okay. Do you have any reason to doubt what, have you seen the deposition of this health care provider, Ms. Runyon? No. Uh, do you have any reason to doubt that Sergeant Day is suffering from this depression that is reflected in this affidavit? I'm not a, I'm not a health care provider, so that's not my determination. Well, you have to make decisions based upon what health care providers give you an information, don't you? I do take that as part of the decision. Yes. Okay. So, looking at this affidavit, uh, do you have any reason to doubt that Sergeant Day was suffering from depression as a result of her work environment with KSP? I would take in consideration if I would have saw this, but also uh, she was not wanting to uh, submit to an internal affairs investigation. And according to this health care professional, there was a reason for that too, wasn't there? Objection to the poll. According to what uh, this says here, 
Paragraph three, number three. Yes. <clears throat> Do you have any opinion as to whether she was suffering from depression? In fact, still does suffer from depression. Do you have any information to indicate she's not suffering from depression? Objection to the poll. I have no way of, of I have no way of knowing that. I have no interactions with uh, Vicki Day. Do you know what the word feigning means, sir? I do not. <coughs> well, based on what's on the internet here, um, It means to pretend or dissemble. Okay. Pretend. Do you have any understanding about what the word feigning means? I said, no, I do not. Well, if, do, you, do you have any information that she's pretending to be mentally disabled? I don't have anything in particular for that. Is Mr. Irvin your spokesman when it comes to proceedings yeah, in court? I don't answer that. You're not drawing me into this, T. What? You're not drawing me into this. Oh, yes, I am. No, sir. Yes, I am. No, sir. Yes, I am. Certify Just the question. The question. <laughs> if Mr. Irvin said in court that, she's, that she, meaning Vicki Day, is not sick, would you agree with that? Objection. Don't answer that. Certify the question. I want to show you some clips, two clips, from Mr. Irvin's appearance in court before Judge Wingate. On here. Mm -hmm. I'm going to object to this. I'm not going to allow it in the record. Oh, we'll oh it's going to be in the record, all right. It's already in the record, Mr. We'll Irvin. Judge, T. Sure. Let's go do it. All day. Let's do it. Just grab that. I'll carry it. Going off the record, time is 11.44. We're now back on the record. Time is 12.57 p.m. Sir, I want to show you what we marked as Exhibit 3. <clears throat> Ask you to identify that if you would. What is that for the record? That is a uh, KSP internal memorandum to uh, Captain Roger Short, uh, which would be uh, Vicki Day's uh, commander, and that uh, would be under my signature, dated May the 15th, okay. 2023. And what's the purpose of that memorandum? That was a <clears throat> uh, explaining, uh, an explanation as to why uh, th there was a directive for uh, Sergeant Day to report for an interview on May the 17th. 2023. Was she on FMLA at that time? According to this memorandum, said the per the medical leave act FMLA, yes. So I want to be sure I understand this. You ordered her to report for an IE interview when she was on FMLA. Based on uh, consultation with the memorandum between uh, the personnel cabinet, general counsel, and our attorneys. Um, 
also human resources management uh, that that was uh, specifically just to answer truthfully any questions directly and narrowly related to the scope of her employment. Is that a yes or a no? That's a yes. Okay. And there was also a warning on there she failed to report, correct? Yes. <clears throat> what was the warning? Specifically this conduct will be consistent with, with insubordination and or obstructing an internal investigation. What level of offense is insubordination? It's a class A. Which can lead up to termination, correct? Yes. 20 days to termination. 21 days. Termination. All right. <clears throat> Did she report? I don't know. I can't remember because we went through a, a multitude of different uh, entities trying to decide for her to uh, report or not. So I don't know if this was the final thing that she reported for the interview or not. Well, Exhibit 1 deals with the time she actually did report, doesn't it? Again, without seeing the day that she reported for the interview and seeing the interview, I don't know specifically what day she did report. Well, that interview, that Exhibit 1 indicates she's going to report for an interview in accordance with that letter, doesn't it? Well, this one says May the 17th. Right. And this letter here is uh, from your office is July 26th. Okay. So would that indicate she did not report to the May 17th directed uh, interview? That's what I would assume. Okay. Now, has any disciplinary action been initiated as a result of her not complying with that directive from you? No. Why not? We just have not, because uh, we're still get had the opportunity for her to be able to have an interview. Okay. Well, she's had the interview now, correct? Yes. So, are, is there going to be any disciplinary action uh, taken against her for not reporting for the May 17th interview? No. What charges are currently pending against Sergeant Day? I don't know specifically, but I do know that they are low-level Class C violations uh, that uh, were classified. Uh, two, right? I believe so. Do you know what they were for? I do not. What is the status of that IA investigation? It's still pending. Uh, Captain Green is working on that. What needs to be done to complete that? I think that, uh, I don't know, I was talking with him specifically, but they may be, uh, I don't, without talking with him directly, I don't know, there may be an additional uh, follow up but I don't know. I've not talked with him specifically about that. Does I fall directly under your command? No. <clears throat> they go through another level? Yes. What level is that? It falls directly under a lieutenant colonel that is uh, the Office of Administrative Services. And who is that? Uh, now that is Lieutenant Colonel Jeremy Ham. Used to be Colonel Nall, didn't it? Lieutenant Colonel Kyle Nall, yes. He got demoted. He got reverted. Well, he went from lieutenant colonel to captain. Is that like a demotion, sir? That's a reversion. Uh, chapter 16, uh, that's, that's a reversion. It's, it was not a demotion. Did it involve a loss of pay? Yes. <clears throat> Why did, was he reverted? Well, anything above the rank of captain is a temporary rank per, per ca uh, chapter 16 to be able to put those up. Uh, but he was reverted as a result of job performance. What about his job performance uh, warranted reversion? Or you call it reversion, I'm going to call it demotion. What about his work performance uh, caused that action to be taken? Uh, there was a uh, alleged domestic uh, involving one of his good friends. That was a lieutenant at the Mayfield Post, and uh, he did not apprise uh, the post commander that uh, that that lieutenant was assigned to of that, nor uh, did he uh, apprise myself as well. Is that a violation of some KSP general order? Yes. Specifically, what? I uh, think of a ranking officer uh, as far as uh, any potential uh, 
policy violations, but they may be a couple of other things. It would be hard for me to say specifically without having uh, the standards of conduct in front of me. Okay. Uh, that involved a domestic situation between the lieutenant and his wife, I believe? Yes. Is that Lieutenant Duvall? Yes. <clears throat> and uh, it was alleged that he had engaged in domestic violence against his wife? Yes. Specifically in what regard? Uh, that uh, there was a uh, domestic uh, event that occurred. Uh, it was uh, that it was possibly physical and uh, that uh, uh, he did not uh, he did not contact the post commander that that occurred in in that area which uh, the post commander of Mayfield Post uh, nor did he notify myself because I would be directly above him. You said it was possibly physical. It actually was physical, wasn't it, sir? Uh, with the investigation, and it, to my understanding, uh, that's not been finalized, uh, but it, uh, it determined that that was unfounded, that that was a, or unsubstantiated, that they was actually a physical domestic, that it was a verbal domestic. Well, videos have a way of getting involved in these proceedings, don't they, sir? Yes. There's a video of that altercation, isn't there? Uh, there was a ring video, but that was uh, looked at and that was vetted out through the investigative process, to my understanding, by the captain that investigated that. Well, the video was actually taken by the daughter, wasn't it? No. Is. The only video that was possible that I was made aware of would be uh, something through a ring, ring camera. Didn't the daughter turn the video over to the FBI? No, not that I'm aware you of. You sure not, about I, that? Not that I was notified. You haven't heard that the daughter had a video of that altercation between her father and her mother and she turned it over to the FBI? Not that I'm aware of. <clears throat> okay. So, as it stands right now, the IA investigation into Sergeant Day is still open? Correct. Is there a time limit under the general orders within which that investigation should be concluded? You, not necessarily. You know, we do like to uh, close those out as soon as possible, but every investigation is different. And uh, there's a lot of circumstances and things that uh, come up that may delay uh, the final conclusion of the investigation to be concluded. Well, there's a, is there a provision in KSP's general orders about a time frame within which those investigations are supposed to be concluded? I'd have to go back and look at the policy. You don't know, I don't as know. we said here today. Now, if I had the policy, I could tell you. And you don't have any idea of any actions that remain to be done with regard to that investigation, is that correct? Not without knowing directly with uh, uh, Captain Green, I do not. When's the last time you talked to Captain Green about this investigation? Uh, I'd say I asked him uh, probably last week if, uh, how's, how's it progressing? He said he's progressing. Did he tell you what else needs to be done? Mm, I think he said he, uh, he just said he's still working on an investigation, possibly uh, more interviews, uh, but we've not talked about that. Who else needs to be interviewed? It, uh, I think he said Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rogers would need to be interviewed. Anybody else? That's all that I can remember. Well, he's got to interview, he was major, now he's Captain Day, correct? Did he, did he schedule another interview for him? I'm not aware of that. I he, thought that that was the same interview with... Uh, uh, he didn't tell you that? No. If he did, I don't remember. Now, um, Sergeant Day was scheduled for interview several times with IA and those interviews didn't happen. Was Ma then Major Day also scheduled for interviews yes. at the same time? Yes. Why was that? Because um, they wanted to be able to uh, interview right at the same time. Why was that? I just to make sure that there would be, uh, we get the true story that there would be no uh, not be able to talk and discuss uh, their testimony. So their interview. 
they wanted to be sure they got them one right after another so they couldn't collaborate their stories yes okay did you give that direction sir no who scheduled the, the interviews i mean captain green did he do it at your instructions we discussed it but not at my instruction did he tell you he was going to schedule one after the other yes did you agreed with it yes <coughs> I want to show you what we marked as Exhibit 4. You recognize that document exhibit four there, sir? I do. What is it? That is a travel uh, request to attend EPIC at El Paso uh, by Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rogers. Okay, and it identifies the people who are going to be involved in that travel, yes. correct? Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rogers, Major Little, Major Day, Lieutenant Sandusky, Meredith Bales. Uh, does she work for Colonel Rogers? She uh, works with intelligence and she's one of the supervisors at our intelligence branch, but she would report directly to Lieutenant Sandusky, and Lieutenant Sandusky would report to Major Little. Major Little would report to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rogers. Which one is Rogers' girlfriend? <clears throat> um, have Miss Bales and Colonel Rogers traveled together before? I don't know without seeing travel requests. I couldn't say I couldn't say yes or no without seeing those. You haven't heard talk around headquarters about that? About what? They're traveling together. No. So this came to you on May the fourth of twenty twenty two and you approved it, is that correct? Yes. And is it supposed to go to Justice and Public Safety after you approve it? Uh, typically, they would go to the, through the cabinet. This one didn't, though, did it? I don't see what that was a line in there, but I'm not saying that it did or did not. Well, it was approved by the governor's office, right? That's correct. Is that standard? It has been, yes. So, you know, we had a lot of things dealing with COVID protocol and then also on out-of-state travel, so yes. Can you give me another example of out-of-state travel that was approved by the governor's office? I would say multiple ones uh, dealing with, uh, uh, I know through CVE, I think there was a, uh, uh, a trip to South Dakota. Uh, I think, uh, there was probably a NASDAQ conference that they went out, so I can think of several that they probably were. Approved by the governor's office. I can't say that. I, don't, I do not see that memorandum after I approve it and it goes out. Uh, I do not see those memorandums that they come back. Okay, so you can't say if there, was, there were other travel uh, approvals by the governor's office other than this one. 
I know that any of the out-of-state travel will go to the governor's office. And the Justice and Public Safety Office, or it, Cabinet. Yes. Um, now, Bethany Maynard, she's filed a lawsuit against KSP, hadn't she? Yes. Are you familiar with it? Yes. What are the allegations in that lawsuit? Uh, I think retaliation. On the basis of what? Uh, that uh, I've not read the actual complaint, uh, but uh, feels like that she did not get a position that she wanted. What was the position? Uh, it was a uh, JPS, I believe is what that was. What's that? I can't remember the exact term what that is, but it was a former position uh, that was vacated uh, that she was special detailed, special dutied into that uh, position. Who detailed her? Um, I think that was a request of, uh, at that time, Nathan Day. He requested, I'm sorry. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rogers. So Major Nathan Day requested she be detailed to that position? To my understanding through the, by Lieutenant Colonel Rogers, yes. Okay, have you talked to Nathan Day about it? Yeah, I think early on we did. Sir? Yeah, early on we did, yes. Okay, what do you recall of that conversation? Uh, that uh, a John Smoot, who had that position, uh, was uh, leaving the agency and was going to uh, basically the same job in federal motor carriers. And they were looking someone to fill that position. And when they uh, made that request, uh, Nathan Day and uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rogers uh, had reached out to her uh, about uh, special duty, special detail to that position. That's what Major Day told you? I don't know if it was in correlation, conversation, together with Mike Rogers or just Mike Rogers told me. Okay. But I do know that Major Day was on board and he did want her in that position. How do you know that? Because that's what Mike Rogers said and that was the discussion. Because they were really worried to where uh, John Smoot was leaving that they would have a hard time uh, being able to uh, keep up with what was going on on the CBE side in the program's management branch. Was Major Day present when that conversation occurred? I can't remember. Uh, I, do, I do not know if that was Lieutenant Colonel Rogers to me or if he was with them together. Okay, well a couple of questions ago I asked you specifically if you had a conversation with Major Day and I thought you said yes and I asked you what the conversation was. That's what I'm trying to focus on is the conversation you had with Major Nathan Day about Bethany uh, Maynard. If uh, with that, that would be the conversation with Mike Rogers and Nathan Day, but they were very concerned that uh, John Smoot was leaving and that timeline and he was leaving that they needed someone in that position uh, quick, someone they could depend upon, uh, someone they felt might be able to be successful in that job. Okay. So you don't recall any specific conversation you had with Major Day about Bethany Maynard? Not specifically, I do not. All right. Uh, back to Exhibit 3 there, um, you talked about uh, all the advice that came in from different sources about how to order Sergeant Day to report for that IA interview. Yes. Can you tell me the names of the individuals who are referred to in there from the legal department and personnel cabinet or whoever else, whoever else is listed in Exhibit 3 there, identify the individuals with whom you spoke. I discussed with uh, Brandy Kelly, who is HR director at uh, for us at headquarters. And Brandy uh, Kelly? Yes. Okay. Is Brandy a lawyer? No. Okay. And then I also discuss with uh, our general counsel, Shauna Kenser. Anybody else? 
that was my only uh, that was my only conversations that I recall with them. Now, uh, general counsel for us uh, may have consulted with the cabinet, uh, but uh, I'm not, I did not. You mind if I take a look at Exhibit Three? So, um, Exhibit Three says after consultation between KSP attorneys, plural. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned one attorney. Was there another attorney at KSP you consulted with? I may have consulted with uh, Amber Arnett. All right. That would be it. Okay. And the Kentucky Personnel Cabinet's general counsel, who was that? That would have been information that I would have asked uh, Brandy Kelly through HR to uh, to obtain, but I did not talk to them specifically, but she would have uh, garnered that information for that conversation. Okay, but you don't know who that would have been at the personnel cabinet, the general counsel? I do not. All right, and uh, in collaboration with Kentucky Justice and Public Safety Cabinet's Human Resources Management, would that have been Brandy Kelly? Yes. What did Brandy Kelly tell you? Uh, that, you know, we all, in discussion, what would be, uh, you know, allowable and appropriate for that interview, uh, that what that was right there would have been uh, appropriate for her to be able to conduct an internal affairs interview. So Brandy Kelly told you it was okay to bring Sergeant Vicki Day in off FMLA for an IA interview? She gave us guidelines that would make that acceptable for her to come in and to be able to do that. What guidelines did she give you? Just that, uh, uh, that that would be a part of her position to come in and to uh, and to do that interview. I can't say specifically what that was, but I do know that she uh, she was consulted on what would be appropriate. We want to make sure that the, everything we did was you know appropriate to be able to uh, have that interview. Well, did you consult with Brandy Kelly? Yes. Okay, and she gave you guidelines about how to get Vicki Day to come in off FMLA to submit to this IA interview, correct? Yes. All right, have you told us all the guidelines you recall? That's all I could call, recall, but said that that would be, uh, that we could have her for an interview uh, based on her discussions when she's checking with the cabinet. And I don't know if, she, if personnel cabinet or just a justice cabinet, but that was the guideline she gave because we want to go make sure we were correct in what we did along with human resources. Okay. <coughs> she didn't express any concerns about bringing Sergeant Day in off FMLA to uh, participate in this interview? Not to me. Well, did she to anybody that you Not know Not that of? I'm aware of. Okay. So, uh, Major Nathan Day went through a personnel action also, correct? Yeah, I have to elaborate. Well, you refer to it as a reversion. Yes. Is that what it was? That was, yes. All right, from major to captain. Correct. When did that happen? I don't have the exact date What's your front of me. What's your best estimate as when it happened? I would have to refer uh, to my notes, but I'm um, say a couple month and a half ago. Okay. Why was he reverted? He was reverted uh, due to the fact uh, we received a uh, memorandum from a Lieutenant Baldock. I'm sorry? From a Lieutenant Baldock. He was B-O-L-D-O-C or D-O-U-C. He is a Lieutenant in Programs at CVE Branch. He submitted a very in-depth, uh, including several allegations of uh, misappropriations of uh, CVE vehicles, assignment, and uh, and some other things. I don't remember exactly what those were, but I do remember it was. I think it was 20 some vehicles that he uh, said were misappropriated that were not. Uh, in line with what the parameters of uh, those federal grants for those vehicles. So <clears throat> when I looked at that, um, I reached out to the federal motor carriers. Her name's Linda Goodman. I'm sorry? Linda Goodman. 
okay? And I reached out to her and, uh, dis and discussed, you know, here's an allegation that I have. I do not have a whole lot of knowledge on the program side and wanted to see what, if there was anything that our agency, if there's any misappropriations or anything wrong. Uh, Ms. Goodman said that she was aware of it, that uh, Baldock, Lieutenant Baldock, had also submitted that memorandum to her. And they were currently looking at it. And then she would get back in touch with me and we would discuss it. So we had a meeting and we went and we met and uh, it was uh, Lu uh, Linda Goodman, it was John Smoot, who is the former KSP employee that now worked there. Uh, it was uh, myself and uh, two other KSP. And then we went through and they said that they were, uh, you know, based on this, you know, we did see that there are numerous vehicles uh, that, are, that are not in line with uh, how this should be, this program should be, uh, an, or should be ran. So <clears throat> with that, we took those vehicles and uh, we went through and we did an inventory ourselves, and they were some that uh, were not, uh, that they didn't have correct, but there was a majority of them uh, that they did, that were, uh, that were out of the CVE function. She said that was not appropriate. Said there were many of those. Uh, so when we did an inventory of that and we looked and we did determine uh, that, you know, based on that information that yes, there was misappropriations of uh, mixed-up vehicles. Uh, during the process of that, there was a, uh, a truck, I think it was a Chevrolet pickup truck, a uh, diesel, uh, that was assigned to the program's branch. And uh, it uh, determined and through looking that, uh, and I asked, uh, uh, where that vehicle was at and asked Major Day and he said it was at his home. Uh, but I already knew that it was at his home because for over a year only he and his son had put fuel in that vehicle and every time it was in eastern Kentucky. So obviously that vehicle had been at the Day's home for over a year. Uh, so um, there was also another uh, event uh, that uh, he uh, he requested to a major button. He requested uh, to purchase uh, some Camaros for speed enforcement for the CVE branch. And uh, Major Button come to me and I said, uh, absolutely not, uh, because that is not in line with CVE function. So he went back, he told Major Day that, Major Day submitted a memorandum anyway to Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rogers, knowing that that would not come to me. Uh, Mike Rogers come to me and asked me about it, and I said I'd already denied it. So, based on those three things, uh, having a vehicle at his home for his personal use uh, and their family, and uh, the misappropriations of the vehicles, and then also we were consistently late uh, on reporting uh, to the federal motor carriers that directly fell up under him. Based upon all that, uh, his, uh, uh, his duties as a major in the CVE branch were, were poor. And as a result, uh, I reverted him. Anything else? No. You said there were two other KSP employees at this meeting with Miss Goodman? Yes. Who were they? Major Bruce Button and Captain Donald Wilson. All right. Uh, and it sounds to me like you did this investigation yourself. No. Well, you headed it up. I reached out to the agency head of that uh, because that was uh, submitted to me. And then you had a command staff member uh, that these allegations come from. So, yes, I did make that. Uh, that contact with Linda Goodman at the Federal Motor Carriers. All right, and did you ever ask Major Day his side of the story? I did. W when was that? When, uh, the day that I reverted him. So, you called him into your office? Yes. Did you record that meeting? I did. And, uh, what did he tell you? Uh, he did not agree 
with uh, the misappropriations of the vehicles. He said that that's the way they have done it for years. Uh, and then I told him and uh, that, well, that's not what uh, Linda Goodman and Federal Motor Carriers and John Smoot have said. And uh, he, that was one thing he disagreed. Uh, he, uh, he said about the vehicle that at his home, he said, yeah, I was wrong. I was wrong there. Uh, and uh, with, the, with the issue with him ordering the Camaros, he uh, said, uh, well, said, I thought all vehicles come to you. And that's not, he knows that's not true because uh, he's been at headquarters for over six years. And uh, unless it's a huge purchase of vehicles, those do not go to the commissioner. So basically he admitted the allegations except that one, right? <laughs> that he had the, the CV vehicle at his house for a year. Yes. And that uh, he submitted the request for the Camaros to Colonel Rogers, knowing that you'd already disapproved it. Yes. He admitted that. Yes. <clears throat> and he thought that the request for the Camaros was going to come back to you through Colonel Rogers. Is that what he said? That's what he said. And you say he knew that was false. Yes. <laughs> All right. Were there any other reasons you had for reverting him? No. Are you aware of any comments that were made to him by Shauna Kenser involving his status with the command staff at a visit to her home? Objection to the form. Objection. Don't answer that question. <coughs> Are you aware that uh, Major Day went to Shauna Kenser's home one night. Objection, don't answer that question. Certify both those questions. Were you aware of any attitude that Colonel Dahl had to try to get rid of Major Day? No. Were you aware of any comment that was made to Major Day that you're going to have to make a choice between KSP and your wife. That who said that? Any comment to that effect? No. You're not aware of that? I've heard that, but I did not hear that there. I've heard that since then. But Where'd I've you hear it? That in conversation, I think, through this litigation. Sir? Through this litigation. Who, made, who relayed that comment to you? I think that was... Uh, I don't think who that did come from. Object and don't answer if it was a lawyer. If it's a lawyer, just say it's a lawyer. It's an attorney. Okay. Do you know who allegedly... I, th I think. I, I'm pretty sure it was an attorney. Or are you telling me you don't know who made the statement to you or who you heard it from? I'm pretty sure it was our attorney. Sir? I'm pretty sure it was our attorney. But you're not you're not willing to say it could have been it couldn't have been somebody else. That's correct. All right. Who allegedly made that statement to uh, Major Day that you gotta make a choice between KSP and your wife? Objection, don't answer that. Certify that question. We just determine, just establish the information he has came from the lawyer. <coughs> All right, we're going to take a little break here and see where we go from here. We're going off the record. Time is 1.34. We're now back on the record. Time is 1.45 p.m. Sir, you were present yesterday for Captain Sandlin's deposition. Yes. And you heard her talk about her non-selection for the permission, uh, position of major while you've been commissioner. Yes. What position was that, do you recall? That was a major, a chief information officer. Who was actually selected for that position? Jeremy Ham. Did you have reasons for not selecting Captain Sandlin? No, not for not selecting her. 
You didn't select her for promotion, did you? That's correct. I picked the, the candidate that I felt would be best for that position. Okay. Uh, so what were the reasons you relied on for not picking Captain Sandlin? Well, there are a multitude of decisions that I take when I make a, a command staff uh, <clears throat> a decision. Uh, first, uh, I do, I look at their, uh, their personnel files. I look at their background. I look at uh, over the course of their career, things that they have done. Uh, and I look at what experience they have. I also look at seniority. And uh, they were uh, three individuals that I, that I really looked at. And uh, ultimately I picked uh, Jeremy Ham. And the reason why I picked Jeremy Ham is because he had three years as working in financial grants management. And we had some huge issues, or not issues, but huge endeavors coming with the agency. We have a radio project uh, that's millions of dollars, and we also have uh, the body cam uh, rollout that we were having that was going to be a big entailing uh, to roll out to the agency. And with that experience, with a lot of purchasing, uh, that was why I picked Jeremy Ham. Were there qualifications that Captain Sandlin had for the position? No. She didn't have any qualifications? Just that uh, she was a, uh, a commander. She was a uh, uh, she was up in rank to where I could uh, be able to look at it and obviously I would look at her her prior history and what she as was as a captain and I took that in consideration as well. What about her prior history as a, not only a captain but a lieutenant and a sergeant? Did you look at that? Yes. And you determined that the person you selected was better qualified than Captain Sandlin? That's correct because every bit of her experience is in operations. She had no experience uh, dealing with financial grants management. Uh, that it was that was the one reason that uh, he was the best candidate. It was because of that experience in financial grants management, as well as his entire career. Uh, you know, he also had come up through the ranks. Uh, he had also been a successful post commander. Uh, that was why. Did you make any comments to Captain Sandlin about why uh, she shouldn't be selected? I just told her the person that I selected was because they had experience that she did not have. Anything else? No. Did you make any comments to her to the effect that you hated to take her away from her family? No. Did you ask her to go home and consult with her husband before uh, and get back with you on that? Yes, as well as every other candidate that I talked with. Okay, well tell us what you told her specifically. Uh, we met at Cracker Barrel, and uh, when you come to headquarters, it's a, uh, it's a big endeavor. Uh, it's a lot of time away from your family. Uh, you do not have the freedom that you have out at, uh, if you're at another entity. And uh, this particular uh, position that we had, uh, there would be a, uh, a lot of purchasing. There would be a lot with this, uh, uh, this position because of radio project as well as uh, uh, the body cameras. So uh, with that, uh, that's some things that some commanders, uh, it's hard for them, uh, I don't know that it's hard for them to accept that you know, you're there uh, and it's 8 to 4.30. That's what that position is. It's not out in uh, uh, anywhere else and throughout the agency. Uh, you know, there are times that you'll have to go uh, and do other things, uh, but the majority of that time is there at headquarters. Uh, so, you know, that's a change from people. I mean, it's a change for anybody that comes up there. Uh, and when you have a family, uh, I, and everybody that I've ever brought up or offered a position, I have uh, asked them to check with their uh, spouse or significant other. You say it's 8 to 4.30? Yes. Are there variations to that uh, time frame? If they have some things that uh, they have to do in their job duties, uh, I mean, if something comes up where they have to come in a little bit late, that's fine. But if there's no other reason, uh, it's 8 to 4.30. Are there people on the command staff now who operate on different hours? I do have uh, everybody's considered 8 to 4.30. Uh, Darren Stapleton. Is uh, I do give him a flex day, and the reason why I give him a flex day is because he has a child or daughter that is autistic, and he needs to attend uh, uh, medical visits with her uh, back in his home area. 
So he has a flexible schedule then, just on one day, on Tuesday, which is her doctor's appointment. Every other day he's expected to be at headquarters. Well, speaking of Major Stapleton, there were problems between him and Captain Sandlin, weren't there? They've had, uh, they've had conflicts. Are you aware of the conflicts? Uh, some of them. What, what are the ones you're aware of? Uh, the one that I am specifically aware of is that uh, she, uh, there was a chicken fighting detail in uh, her post area, and uh, there was a, I think a memo, or there was something about an assignment, something to do with the detail that uh, I think was either she crafted it or Major Stapleton crafted it. But they were, there were issues with it and uh, looked like that he had, I don't know if he'd cut and paste from another memo and tried to take a shortcut, but uh, it was not correct. And she, uh, she had concerns with it and she reached out uh, to be able to discuss it. And uh, so uh, we did meet with her to discuss that. Well, she testified about that yesterday, didn't she? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that a yes? And yes. Uh, basically she said Major Stapleton lied, correct? That's what she said. Well, did that concern you? Uh, it did. Uh, and uh, in the meeting, uh, I asked uh, Lieutenant Colonel Rogers to follow up on that and see what the issue was. Has he done that? Yes. What was his result? He said that uh, basically it was probably sloppy work by Major Stapleton. And, uh, but he didn't see anything substantial going forward with that. Okay, so he didn't consider it to be a lie? No. What was the basis of uh, Captain Sandlin saying it was a lie? That he had published that as his memorandum when in fact he had not published it and had been cut and pasted from her uh, communications? You know, I did not read that, so I don't know, I can't say. Well, it's a concern of yours if a member of the command staff is accused of lying, isn't it? It is. That's a Class A violation, isn't it? It is. So are you saying that Colonel Rogers investigated that and didn't find any basis for concluding that Major Stapleton had lied? I asked him to look into it, and he did, and basically he said that it was, it was sloppy work, and that, uh, but he didn't see any reason to go anything further. Not that it, he didn't say anything about a lie or anything like that. Well, that was the allegation, wasn't it, that he lied? No, not necessarily. I think that just uh, she had concerns, said that, you know, he, he receives emails or she receives emails from him. Uh, in the past, it's had uh, gr grammar issues. She said, I just don't feel like that he is, uh, she, she said, I just don't feel like that he is uh, very competent in his job. And that's what she said. Well, I'm not talking about competency. I'm talking about the line. Uh, was any documentation generated as a result of that investigation or that inquiry by uh, the colonel? She, I think she had some information and those were given to Lieutenant Colonel Rogers because he was at the meeting, but I never reviewed those. I had him to follow up on that. Did he give you anything in writing about his conclusions? No. It was all oral? Yes. Well, there were other issues between Captain Sandlin and, uh, or Major Sandlin and uh, Captain Sandler. Yes. What were they? Um, she, uh, she had a conflict with Major Stapleton uh, at, uh, uh, during in the flood detail. Uh, she was concerned that she felt like that she uh, that wasn't getting uh, the amount of personnel uh, that she needed for that. And uh, she felt like that she was, that he was not assisting her to help her get proper uh, personnel. And she had just issues with him. Uh, uh, you know, just felt like he, she was, he wasn't getting the support, or she wasn't getting support that he needed. So, and then I told her, I said, well, uh, let me check in on it. And then uh, I checked with Lieutenant Colonel Rogers and we were doing basically the same things that we were doing out in uh, Western Kentucky when a tornado hit out there, uh, bringing people in from outside in. Uh, I do remember one thing specifically that she had issue with was that uh, the troopers that were coming in, she wanted to be able to dictate, I think, when they worked. Uh, but there was an issue with that because well, she wanted the work of the night but now here we had these roadways washed out 
we had trees down, we had power lines down, and you were bringing troopers from other places that did not know that area, and that became a safety issue. But we brought in troopers so the troopers that were affected by the flooding and their families would have time uh, after the initial uh, just couple days, uh, you know, obviously dealing with life-saving things with that, to be able to help them to where, you know, we could have coverage, we could have uh, things that we needed for the agency and that post, which was multiple posts, uh, to be able to operate efficiently. So was her concern then unjustified in that regard also? It, it, uh, I realized that it was, uh, you know, there was a lot going on, but uh, I wanted to assure her that we were giving her the personnel that she needed just like we did out in Western Kentucky during the tornadoes. And if she needed anything else, you know, we would try to help uh, with what she requested, what she needed. Yes, sir. Uh, but she had an issue with the way Major Stapleton was dealing with her, didn't she? She contacted me uh, because, uh, you know, I was the East Troop Major uh, for two years. I know. And, and uh, worked with her, and she always knew she could contact me directly if she needed anything. And I told her, I said, if, you know, if there's an issue or something, you let me know. And that's why she reached out to me. I went to the post to talk with her to address that. But I explained to her uh, why, and after talking with Lieutenant Colonel Rogers, what was the thought process on that, that the troopers coming out there shouldn't be working of a night. Uh, they should be working of a day. They're there to augment and supplement that post and be able to help them. Did Captain Sandlin have an issue with Major Stapleton over that problem? Yes. She expressed her concerns to you about that issue, didn't she? Yes. Were her concerns justified? Not in this, uh, it's not a simple, uh, I'm gonna say no, because, okay. uh, we, uh, because we put the resources out there that they needed. I know the command staff, including myself and others, were there for multiple days on the ground to be able to assist them as well, so troopers or, and civilians that were affected by the flood could deal with the issues that they needed to. So those were two instances where she expressed concerns to you about Major Stapleton, which you found were unjustified? Yes. Did she ever express any other concerns about him? Yes. What were they? Uh, she had an issue with, uh, uh, during a presidential visit, which was at the same time. What was uh, the nature of that issue? What that was, and I wasn't aware of it, uh, but I know when we were, uh, when we found out that uh, President Biden was coming in, uh, we were requested to have a meeting with Secret Service and, and some other federal entities and different partners. Uh, so after I'd had the first meeting with her and she felt like we weren't getting, she wasn't getting support that she needed, which, uh, you know, we looked at the schedule, we looked at the personnel that was sent there. We did feel like that was adequate. Uh, I know we had pulled, uh, I think they were CADs that we would ask, you know, the amount of complaints that were coming in, they weren't, uh, I don't think they were overwhelming. So we want to make sure that they had what they needed or what, what the post needed. But, you know, when, my, when I went and met with her at post when she contacted me, uh, one of the things she said, you know, I'm overworked, we need help. Uh, so after when we found out President Biden was coming in, uh, typically that would fall on the post to be able to organize that, uh, that visit. They would do the heavy lifting on all the scheduling. Uh, there's a huge amount that's, that's involved with that. So I told Major Stapleton, I do not want post to have to deal with that. They are dealing with the flood. You are to deal with uh, coordinating the, the presidential visit. And that way that will take any stress off the supervision at the post or whatsoever. And matter of fact, we brought even additional people from surrounding posts to be able to come, in the, come over there and, and assist with that. Um, I think later on that day, <coughs> uh, Major Stapleton had contacted me and Lieutenant Colonel Rogers and said that uh, Captain Sandlin was upset uh, that she was not going to be a, a part of uh, the presidential. And I said, why? And said, it just felt like that, uh, that I didn't need to be there. Or that's what she said, 
That's what Major Stapleton said, that Captain Sandlin said. Uh, but I said, well, that's not true because I told you to handle that, to take the, the pressure off the post. But I said, what I want you to do is contact her and tell her if she wants to be there, uh, she can be there at the presidential uh, visit that was in Breathitt County. So had Major Stapleton told Captain Sandlin she was not to be at the presidential visit? That, I don't, I don't know that conversation, but I know it was told that she did not have to coordinate the visit of, uh, of that presidential visit because I was going to have him to do it to relieve her in the post of that duty. Well, I'm, I'm confused. Mm -hmm. Captain Sandlin made an issue out of what Major Stapleton had to do with that presidential detail as it related to her, correct? She said that, uh, well, I didn't talk to her about that in particular. This was information that was relayed to me from Major Stapleton, that she was upset that she was taken out of the, uh, taken out of the process. And, but after that, later, uh, she called me, and then I went to post a second time days later, and we discussed that. Did she have a concern about Major Stapleton's conduct? Yes. What was it? She felt like that he was uh, uh, being uh, nitpicking towards her, and she just she said, "I'm not going to talk with him uh, around anybody else unless somebody else is around." And I said, "Well, fine. You can contact Lieutenant Colonel Rogers directly." Did she give you examples about his nitpicking? Uh, no, I don't believe if she did. I don't remember. She's a pretty detail-oriented captain, isn't she? Mm, she's, yes. She documents stuff too, doesn't she? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't know about that. You don't? No. Was she in, uh, you were East Troop Commander? Yes. Was she under you when you were East Troop Commander? Yes. Did you understand how she performed her duties then? Yes. Outstanding, weren't they? They were good. Well, I'm saying outstanding, sir, not good. They were good. You won't go with outstanding? They were good. Sir, the question was, will you go with outstanding, yes or I no? I won't say outstanding, but they were good. Okay. Uh, what about this Career Service Achievement Award? Do you know about that? I do. Tell us about it. I think that was uh, generated by her lieutenant, uh, Jackie Joseph, and it was sent through the chain, uh, and then uh, it's sent to the KSP Awards Board. So that when it comes through, uh, you know, we'll review it and then send it on to the KSP Awards Board. Has it been approved? Uh, it was sent to the KSP Awards Board. Oh, well, has, has it going to be awarded to her? I have not seen the final list if she's received it or not, so I do not know. If she gets that award, is that for good service or outstanding service? Uh, It'd be for uh, outstanding service. Were there any other issues that were brought to your attention between Major Stapleton and Captain Sandlin? You repeat the question. Were there any other issues brought to your attention between Major uh, Stapleton and Captain Sandlin? Uh, I think that she, uh, there was a, uh, new hire request or resignation, no it was a resignation uh, that uh, was sent through by another post and a Major Stapleton misinterpreted coming from her post and sent it back to be uh, corrected but it was not from her post. What it was, the, the person that submitted that memorandum, his initials, uh, well, anyway his name was Jim Shelton J.S. and then he did not look at it, uh, he just, a, a mistake, and it was Jim Shelton, uh, Jennifer Sandlin. So he sent it to her instead of Jim Shelton. But Jim Shelton is not a captain, uh, so he was the acting uh, captain at that time through post 14 because I believe the post commander was away. So was that concern she expressed to you legitimate? With uh, everything else that went on, I, I'm fine with her expressing that. Well, the concern was legitimate. Uh, Major Sandlin had made a mistake, correct? 
But she didn't make a mistake on that. Major Stapleton made the mistake. That's what I said. Major Stapleton okay. made the mistake. Yeah. Right? Yes. So the four things that you've mentioned that she's brought to your attention, one of them turned out to be valid. Objection to the form. That one was just a, uh, if we're talking about the, the memo on the return on the resignation, that was a, a clerical error. No big deal, right? No, I just, okay. hate, I just hate that that happened uh, with her. Any other issues between Major Stapleton and Captain Sandlin? Not that I'm directly aware of, no. Did you change her chain of command reporting structure? Yes. What, to what was it changed to? I changed, after that, I changed it to where she would report to uh, Major uh, uh, Matthew Johnson. And the reason why is to take any other conflict that might possibly arise between her and him. But even through all of our other conversations that we've had, I've always told her that if you have an issue with Major Stapleton, you can reach out directly to Lieutenant Colonel Rogers or you can reach out to myself. Major Matthew Johnson, West Troop Commander? Yes. Does he have a Class A violation in his file? I, I have not seen one. Are you aware of it, sir? I have heard, but I have not seen one. What have you heard? That there was a violation. A Class A violation, correct? Yes. In Bowling Green, correct? I don't know about that. What, were the, what was the nature of the allegation? I do not remember. I do not know I've not read that. Did it have anything to do with giving alcohol to a minor woman? Uh, again, I don't know. I've not read that. I've not heard that. Did you select him to be on the command staff? No. Uh, did Commissioner Sanders? Yes. Would that cause you a problem if he had had that Class A violation and you knew about it? I would have to take everything in context uh, before I made that decision. You know, how long ago it happened, what was the nature of it. Uh, you know, I would have to vet that out, but I would have to look at it more in depth. Are you aware of any other allegations involving uh, Major Matthew Johnson and KSP property? Yes. What? That he was alleged to have had a tractor at his home. It wasn't just alleged, he had it at his home, didn't he? I was not, uh, I was the East Troop Major at that time, so I cannot say specifically what did happen and what did not happen. Well, I did you, not follow up on that. You were the commissioner when we had a trial in Frankfurt in February of 2022, weren't you? Yes, I was a witness. And you were aware that that allegation came out during that trial? I only sit, I sit for, when I come in, then I think I sit the rest of that day, but I, I wasn't there for the entire trial. That tractor was a tractor that was actually uh, ordered forfeited to KSP, wasn't it? Yes. And it went through some major repairs. I don't know. And after the repairs, it was delivered to Major Matthew Johnson's home in Hardin County, wasn't it? I don't know. And after it had been there for about a year, there was going to be an inspection at Post 4 that was going to be conducted by whom? Who was over inspections at that time? I don't know. His brother, wasn't it? I don't know if he was the captain at that time or not. I do not know. Did the tractor show up at Post 4 right before that inspection? I do not know. So let's talk about the flood relief effort again. Uh, was that done in phases? Yeah, I mean, I think after we send like a contingent of troopers there, they would serve so many days and then they would be uh, other troopers that would come in and relieve them. So phase one, were you familiar with that? I am not. Were you familiar with the fact that women were excluded from phase one? No. Would it surprise you to know that? I would. I had not heard that. I, I wouldn't know, know why they would be or not be. Would it have to do with lodging? Did you, you weren't aware of any of that? No. Would it concern you that women were excluded from one phase of that flood relief plan? It would have to be dependent on what the lodging was, but I do not know uh, what, the, what the basis of that was at that time. Was that during while you were commissioner? Yes. 
Is this first you'd heard of it that women have been excluded from phase one? Yes. <coughs> Who was responsible for making personnel assignments for this flood relief if it below you? Well, that would have been in conjunction with Lieutenant Colonel Mike Rogers, uh, Major Stapleton, and then Captain Sandlin, as well as the other affected commanders. I think Captain Serber had some involvement as well. Uh, because I think it affected his post as well. Was that something that would have, you should have known about if women were going to be excluded from that phase one? No. Okay. That may be all. We'll just take a short break. Do we have anything else? We're going off the record. Time is 2.11. We're now back on the record. Time is 2.17. Just a few more questions, sir. Uh, I want to talk about, I believe he's now Lieutenant Colonel Jeremy Hamm. Yes. Was there an EEO complaint on him? Not that I'm aware of. It was a complaint. Uh, I, I asked about that, and he said there was an allegation about uh, when he was at Financial Grants Management uh, that uh, he had changed... Uh, I think they were having some problems in financial grants management, and then he wanted people to uh, personnel to be there, and he may have changed one of one of the individual schedule, and I think that maybe she made a complaint. Uh, he was never notified that it was an EEO complaint, but he said he was uh, interviewed about it, and was never received any further documentation or anything about that. There was never an IA, anything conducted. Uh, so. Was there an actual complaint filed with EEO? You know? There was a complaint filed, but I do not know that if it was an EEO complaint. Okay. But I was not in, uh, in the chain of command or anything at that time, his chain. Did you tell, uh, I guess it was then Captain Ham, that he would have to make things right with this female civilian? I told him uh, that uh, with the promotion, obviously, is that, uh, that he needed to make sure that there were any, you know, problems with them because her mother worked there as well, and uh, I did not want any conflict. Yes, sir. But my question is specifically: Did you tell him, quote, you would have to make things right, unquote, with this female civilian? No, I did not say that specifically. Okay. Um, do you know who the female civilian is? Yes. Is she under his chain of command currently? Yes. Have you done any follow-up to see if everything has been straightened out between him and this female employee? Uh, I have not done any follow-up, but there was not an issue that I'm aware of. Did you ask this female employee if she had any issues working with Colonel Ham? No. Did anybody, to your knowledge? Not to my knowledge. When you promoted him to Lieutenant Colonel, how long had he been a major? Uh, maybe just a little, right at a year, maybe less than a year, but it was close. It was less than a year, wasn't it? I believe it was close. Any reason why you'd promote him to Lieutenant Colonel with less than a year as major? Yes because that position that was open, that takes a, uh, a special skill set dealing with uh, budget. That is, uh, and that was his three years of financial grants management experience to why I even promoted him to major there over that project in the CIO. So we had that experience because that is a huge part of that. Uh, we do not have a, an actual budget director uh, so, you know, we have budget coming up this year. He has experience with that. And also he has experience in internal affairs when he worked there. So uh, that also falls directly under uh, the umbrella of uh, that lieutenant colonel spot in Office of Administrative Services. So that's why he was uh, selected for that position. Can you let us know the name of that female employee? Amber Burr. What's her position currently? You know, 
I don't know the exact title, but it's in financial grants management. Okay. Now, I believe before you talked about uh, uh, KSP is not covered by KRS 15520. It's an 18A. 16. I'm sorry, 16A. So are there rights under 15520 that you know of that are not afforded to KSP employees? I do not know. I, I, I go by Chapter 16. Okay. Well, I want to show you what we've uh, identified here. We can call this Exhibit 5. Is KRS 15520. Uh, let me have that one back, if you don't mind. <clears throat> have you ever looked at 15520? No. Well, I'm going to ask you to look at it now, if you don't mind. Specifically, um, paragraph 4A. Ask him to look at paragraph 4A. That talks about enforcement law procedures. Do you understand what that means, sir? Objection. That's a legal document. It's a statute that speaks for itself. Don't answer that. Certify that question. Does a um, KSP employee get a 48-hour notice prior to being questioned by Internal Affairs about any investigation IA is doing? No. Does the KSP employee get a complaint detailing the allegations against him or her prior to an IA interview? Uh, yeah, I think there may be a few select that they do not, that in the majority they do, yes. I'm sorry. In the, in the, unless there's an extenuating circumstance that they do not, but in the uh, overwhelming amount of times, yes, they do receive a, uh, that complaint. The complaint signed by a member of KSP? Yes, unless there's some reason for it to be uh, confidential or something of that nature. Okay, so that 40-hour notice, does that notice include a statement regarding any reason for the interrogation? Objection to the form. Repeat the question. Does that notice uh, include a statement regarding any reason for the interrogation? <coughs> what statement are you, are you incurring? The notice that is given to the KSP trooper. Yes. It does include that concludes one more time I'm sorry a statement regarding any reason for the interrogation you know I would have to see those but I think that they've been accused of violating the standards of conduct I believe is what that says that there's a possibility of your violation of the standards of conduct and that they will be an investigation uh, there's kind of like a a, a, a form uh, germane type letter that's sent out <laughs> All right. So, um, if through the investigation it's determined there might be a basis for the charge, is the officer informed of the details of the charge? I think it says it's possible violations of the standards of conduct. But it could be on some of them. That they're all different uh, to a point. It depends on what the, the nature of the complaint is. I think that's all. Give us a few minutes. Going off the record, time is 2.26.
We're back on the record. Time is 2.29 p.m. The defense have no, no questions for the witness. You're complete. <coughs> this ends the deposition. The time is still 2.29.